Hi, I'm David King from The Collaborative. I'm joined by Katie Cusack and Maureen Sager from the Upstate Alliance for the Creative Economy. Um, there's a lot going on, obviously. <laughs> With Ace, there, there's always a lot. But um, you just finished up the culmination of the Creative Capital uh, series for WMHT, and you co-hosted with Guha Bala, and you have this new series of uh, events that take folks around the eight counties that sort of you represent. Um, so uh, this also comes just as, uh, I mean, it's been a few months now, but uh, you, you guys joined with the, um, I'm going to get this wrong. Go but, ahead. Uh, no, I think you better tell me. <laughs> <laughs> the Center for Economic Growth. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's a time for a lot of growth for you, and I, I'm wondering, first of all, what that change meant for ACE and if it allowed you know you to do do more. Yeah, um, I think what was really amazing about the Center for Economic Growth thing was that we've always said that this creative economy project is not an arts project, it's an economic development mm -hmm. project, right? And so it addresses the arts, and that's one component of the creative economy. And yet we've always tried to make that quantified um, statement as to what we add to the economy. It is the fourth largest employment sector in the capital region. It employs 36,000 people, 16,000 freelancers. You know, that's what we're trying to say uh, to economic development agencies is that this is an investable sector. Um, not just nice to have, but mm -hmm worthy of state investment, private investment, um, so that all of the people um, and the businesses that are in the creative economy can be seen in a different light, you mm -hmm. know, as something that uh, is the part of the these organizations that change towns and, and are part of our whole economic development strategy here. So that's been super important. Philip Morris has, you know, been saying this for years, and Robert Altman, people have been at it for a long time, but it was really when we got the data that and started driving that data that helped other people into the equation and think, um, you know, we can't we can't lose this sector because we drive $1.4 billion in earnings. You can't sneeze at that. Mm -hmm. Once we're talking billions, you know, that that's a different conversation. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, there's no doubt the conversation has shifted drastically um, since the numbers came out, um, and it's a regular topic of conversation in um, media generally around here. Um, what... Um, what's your take on the the creative capital series um, and what it what it added to the conversation? Yeah, last year when we did our roundtable tour, which is um, early 2018, WMHT went full on and they they recorded every one of those conversations. They were there before me and left after <laughs> me, and it was a grueling tour um, with 750 p attendants, but really just a lot of logistics around it. And they started recording those conversations. They gave us a transcript of the conversations, which is huge. If you know, yeah. just as yeah. just as a lift, you guys know this. Transcripts are fantastic. We've, you know, been, just, we've been dealing with that, yeah. For sure. So, you know, it's just some for someone to do that for you, that's huge. But to also um, report back to the public on what others were saying besides me, because mm. goodness knows that's not the point. The point is what's happening out there in the community. They helped us show that, and they used a lot of airtime. They did. 30 segments, I believe, um, on creative economy businesses and people and um, stories in all eight counties. So mm -hmm. to have airtime against was so huge. And um, Matt Rogowitz was the producer of all of those spots. And so he did that creative economy step of going into people's homes and looking at their freelance business. You know, this is right. what a freelancer looks like. Is it glamorous? <laughs> it's someone no. with a cup of tea and four, four monitors or, you yeah. know, something set up in their backyard. He brought people into it rather than us just talking about it. Right. He showed it. And that was, that was a really huge thing. Mm -hmm. Um, the creative capital was the culmination of that. They wrapped up, um, that, series of um, aha spots with a special and Guha Bala hosted it. So he was a really great host. And we that. were just talking about, um, you know, uh, Guha and his brother, obviously were transformational figures for the area um, with uh, first Vicarious Visions, right? Um, and which was the Guitar Hero franchise and a number of other things. And then they uh, Vicarious Visions was sold to Activision, which is a giant gaming monolith responsible for Call of Duty and games like that. And then they left and they founded Villain Ventures. Um, and I know a few people who work there. 
And I have to say, it's not unlike working in the clandestine services because they are not allowed to talk about what they're doing. <laughs> um, and they've contracted with Electronic Arts, which is perhaps an even bigger gaming monolith compared yeah. to... Um, so anyway, I mean, uh, he is someone who is deeply invested in, in making sure that all of the facets of, of sort of um, training and and uh, workforce are, are in the region. And I, just thinking about the kind of people that I know that work there, whether it's designers, uh, programmers, et cetera, it takes a, a wide swath of folks with different talent. Um, and he's been committed to not only pushing the tax credit to draw people in, but, but sort of education. Um, what was it like working with him, and, and what has your relationship been like with him, given that you're both working on these sort of similar... Yeah, we've been... Um, I met him when we first started doing this creative economy work because he was one of the original team, and this is going back like six or seven years mm -hmm. now, and um, what was really interesting about when we started that project was that a lot of us did not know each other. We didn't spend a lot of time in the, in the room, but when they started the report, which with a... A consulting firm called Mount Auburn Associates it was the first time that a lot of I, I had never met Philip or Robert or Guha um, or any of the 50 or 60 people who were gathered in that room and that was the start of this whole movement of saying what do we have here in these eight counties um, so Guha brought this super unique perspective and he's kind of a superstar you know for mm -hmm. for Guitar Hero is a really big cultural idea you mm -hmm. know it's, it transcends mm -hmm. game dumb it's it's a it's a giant idea so for that guy to be living here or melissa oftermauer to be living here all yeah. the people that we didn't know were right here you know or hadn't met or put under the same this package mm -hmm. of the power of people who live up here was super interesting so gu has always been a leading voice for that stuff um and to make the connection between um where media and design because that uh, digital gaming skirts both of those and yep. is contained in both of those sectors um, to have him be able to speak to that so that someone can say that graphic designer is related to that giant company mm -hmm. is really important for understanding the depth and breadth of the creative economy. So I think he gets to show where this can go. You know, it's full potential of every mm -hmm. one of those individuals, right? Mm -hmm. so. Having, um, you know, uh, we've worked with Arzu um, Flahi who uh, does you know just did a couple murals for downtown Al Albany mm -hmm. and has done a cover for us, but she also works with, has worked with them and is here because of the video game industry. Yeah. Um, so it's you know it's so interesting that her story, uh, you know, immigrating from Iran and and going to Canada and then being drawn here by the video game industry, she brings with her not only her talents but her culture and um, is is an advocate for. Uh, not only immigrants, but for artists, and it, you can see how the the the, right. <laughs> the local uh, creative you know sector has changed because of uh, the wealth of folks who have come in or who have come up and realized they have an opportunity to to work in that field. Um, I think. I'm going to interrupt you yeah. right there because I'm one of those people who yeah. moved up. I lived in Brooklyn, and I used to be um, before I moved here. I was an executive producer and site director for NickJr.com, which is a giant website for kit for little kids. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't have this much potential in New York. You know, mm -hmm. when you're stuck in a giant corporation, yeah. mm -hmm. it is a bunch of people standing around with properties that are too valuable to do anything with. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how little you can do mm -hmm. with a with a very important property. Like I worked on Blue's Clues and Dora <laughs> the Explorer. You know that right. set. And, yeah. Um, you can't change those characters. Those Bibles are written. Those properties are worth billions of dollars, and it was actually not that exciting. Right. I was just, I was so disappointed. You know, I, I, those are, that's what I aspired to do, and yeah. I didn't realize how little opportunity you get um, in New York. You're stacked with lawyers from a hundred steps above you to a hundred yeah. steps below you, and um, I've been so freed up, and I think that a lot of people have said the same thing. Um, being released from like that New York corporate thing is that this is an amazing playing field. We can do anything here, and mm -hmm. I didn't feel like that for one day in New York. Let alone your rent, paying your rent and daycare <laughs> right. and all those things. And also, it's like, crushing. 
in roles where you can kind of like start at the bottom and learn a lot of different things, which is like where, especially like I know a lot of people my age are trying to like get in wherever they can and try to learn as many things as possible to see where they would best fit. It's a lot harder to do that in New York because you're so replaceable. There's so many people who are trying to do the same thing. And like in this area, there's a lot of spaces for people to go and like new things popping up all the time too, where people are starting their own like record companies or like design outfits or what have you. Like it's there's always something for and somebody something to try. We yeah, just, too. We just spoke to Patrick Harris about um, the idea that you know his, his <laughs> he was saying to me you know his family still is you know, his parents you know why aren't you going to New York? And oh it's yeah. Like, My friends who are there don't have that kind of opportunity that yeah. I have to build something and bring people together, um, and they're isolated. And I mean, that's something even um, that part about being isolated and, and just life being harder is something you know, we've heard from Joe Mom in Nitzburg, um, all sorts of people who, who now live here but used to, to work in you know, L.A. And, and New York. Yeah, I, I'm a freelancer. I've, we've run ACE entirely on freelancers to help us be reflective of our audience in one way, but yeah. also because I've fallen in love with it. I would never freelance in New York. Your rent is too much. You can't. Yeah, yeah. I would never. Mm-hmm. You know, so this is one of those things that I'm afforded is an t- entirely different chapter of my career. It's been so interesting for me. And I, there's no way yeah. that if you can even have a career past 40 in New York in the entertainment industry, good luck to you. Be a woman and do that. Mm-hmm. Forget it. And, you know, that really, this I cannot say enough about this place. It's been personally really great, but I see it for right. people of all ages and backgrounds. Yeah. Yeah, trying to break into it is a lot. And, mm-hmm. like, trying to be someone who's doing a bunch of different things as a freelancer, too, is, like, it's a little bit less challenging to, like, have sort of just a, a lot of side jobs and not one central thing um, because you're not, like, relying on all of those things or, or, like, knowing that you have to pay this hefty fun just to exist in a space that's like looks like you are accomplishing something I guess if that makes sense Mm -hmm. yeah not going to bed with a sick stomach every night it's been great for me (laughs) I've got to say yeah one of so one of the things we I I talked with Patrick about uh in a a conversation and one of the things we're, we're stumbling upon with our musician survey is that folks are still struggling to sort of get paid in their freelance gigs and that Mm. You know, especially music, which I think sort of fosters that culture of of you you want to be a star or you yeah. want your music out there. We so gave play you for the free. stage. What do you want? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do you think that could change? I mean, what do you think needs to happen to sort of change that mentality locally, um, or or create the kind of wealth that could be passed down from say a bar owner to mm-hmm. to someone who's playing a gig? Yeah, I think that education. And you guys talking about it helps, right? Yeah. Because I used to run an art gallery. When I first started the art gallery, I would ask people to come, my friends, to come play. And it took, an, until someone told me about it, mm-hmm. I wasn't being a bad person. I just didn't mm-hmm. know as much about it. Right. So bringing up the topic and um, having people on both sides of that equation feel more comfortable about the conversation, because we're yeah. well-intentioned, right? So assume good intention for people. They do want to give you that stage for them to be able to talk about the, or for us to help broker that conversation about yeah. the economics of running a venue and of being a musician, both sides, right? How do you come to that? And I think just going into it with a lot of education and all of us feeling like we have a shared stake in mm-hmm. each other's uh, success mm-hmm. is really important. And I don't think that that's, well, I'm turning into a New York basher in my <laughs> golden age, but I, I don't know if that's always true in New York. You know, you can just musicians by the pound, you know, right, they, right. They're, if you oh, don't yeah. want it, there's someone else. And that's not true here. I think that we know each other and are, are connected to each other three or four degrees. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that we, to sort of empower ourselves to have that conversation comfortably, Keep bringing it up, right? We should yeah. we should always be talking about it and helping um, people who have run into that problem talk it through with them and and keep banging away at this because right. I think that locally we can affect that and say we you know we just have a um, best practices and you know what we could literally do have a the collaborative and it, like we could write it up and say these are some bre- best practices we've seen mm-hmm. yeah why not right it's we it's yeah. from what we've learned and heard right. and we would say this is a great way to treat a freelancer this is a great yeah. way to treat a musician and i'd read it and follow it i would have gladly have done that i just didn't know yeah, you know yeah. so 
I would draw up a manifesto. Yeah. We should draw up a manifesto <laughs> and be like, this, you know, like this is yeah. how to be a good person, you know, in, <laughs> in a creative field. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. serious. Well, well, you know, obviously there's, there, there are like time and places where people are more than willing to play for free right. or, or, you know, but uh, for people who have just found that there's no way to do it without um, getting paid. I mean, it, it may obviously speak to the economics of, running a venue um, mm-hmm. and, and knowing well, let, that... Let's help yeah. someone understand that too yeah. on the yeah. other side, right? Let's talk yeah. about all of those things about about the reality of that. I think it will just help everyone. Yeah. And maybe even just give the guidelines for a conversation so that you're not... You don't feel like you're the first person to ever <laughs> ask that question. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so that, that would be helpful right. to know that many of us have tread in these waters before mm-hmm. and not elegantly always, but, you know... Yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, I do think that that is particularly a problem in, in the arts um, for folks feeling like I'm being, uh, I want attention, I want my work to get recognized, and I feel guilty because of it. Yeah. Um, right. And you run into it a lot. Um, and folks even not wanting to say that they're an artist or that they're, you know, I, I do this, but it's not my thing. Um, or it's not. Or I'm know, not very good. Yeah, I'm yeah, not like very they good. They don't want to be held to a certain yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, but I feel like the creative economy conversation has changed that a bit um, and that folks are more willing to, to come forward and say, this is what I've been working on and share it. And you see people getting more recognition. Um, mm. But Yeah, I think that the conversation that you guys just brought up extends into freelancing as well of how to get paid on time, of right. how to write a contract. You know, mm. these all of these things are so helpful yeah. and you wouldn't know it unless someone told you about it because there's right. not a guide this is new you know um i went down to some freelancers union events in new york before and while we were developing the a series to see what they were doing because they had had their series going on for 10 years maybe more and uh there were people of all ages i mean 60 year olds and 19 year olds who were down and i went to an, an one uh the topic was contracts these people had smoking contracts. That <laughs> I learned so much, and it had nothing to do with age. It was just really there, you know, that they had learned from each other right. and shared their contracts. And th- that's super that's powerful. Yeah. You get your power back, yeah. and you help your client understand what's a good way to treat you mm-hmm. and what you want to know. And usually, someone will follow you if you're mm-hmm. very clear. But um, the clarity with which they were speaking, I was blown away. I I learned so much. The struggle in digital media um, with some of my colleagues and Vice and all those things and the unions. Union, <laughs> union, wow, I'm not going to say this. Unionization, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> um, and the impact it's had. I mean, these people are standing up for themselves and it, it changes things. Um, and not always for the better for them in the immediate uh, because they're left struggling. But these are people who then I've watched them develop their own brands and it's yeah. a risky thing to do, but it takes, you know, it, it seems to be rewarding. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I would know, but, yeah. uh, so let's talk a little bit about the, uh, the new, new events. Um, your first one is in Unahog at, in Kuzik Falls. Um, talk a little bit about why you chose Unahog. Sure. Um, well, just to start with how we came into the road trip idea was generally because I'm on the road all the time. Mm. And so when we try and we try to do a different county or at least hit every one of the, each county each year, and we're on our probably 36th event. It's been a lot of them. Um, and part of the discovery of going out there is how much is in every corner of this region, right? And so I don't know that we've ever told the whole story of what happens when you create one of these events. It's sort of letting everybody in on that spirit of discovery. Mm-hmm. You were just at the um, Kinderhook uh, out at the Jack Sheenman yeah. Gallery. Were we blown away or what? Oh, well, it was, yeah. I mean, it's sort of funny for me because uh, my mother used to bring me to that town, to the rock shop that's there. It's no longer a rock shop, you know. Um, it was a, it was like a little vacation. It was like the little weekend trip we'd always take. And then the idea that there is this former school filled with war that was filled with Warhol and uh, Basquiat was just. I mean, I would have driven. I, I know I drove past that place three or four times without realizing what I was driving past. And then when you um, get to right, yeah. it was it was crazy. The yeah. de- the it was good on every level. Um, but then when you get to the town, it's like, oh my gosh, right. this setting and where to eat lunch and mm-hmm. all the story of every restaurant. It's sort of doing that is pulling all those strings together and saying, yeah. this is in our backyard. We have 
dozens. We must have, we could have a hundred of these towns that have that kind of story surrounding mm. them, right? And when you start talking to any of these places or venues, they've created their own communities sure, yeah. within there that they're anxious to talk about. So it's kind of just broadening these creative economy mixer ideas, which are great. You know, everybody, they're going great. Mm. But why not wrap in that story of where it is? You know, mm. the place matters too. And so we're just broadening it out a bit to say, while you're going to Unahog, which is way out there, there are other p- things to do. If you haven't ever walked into Brown's Brewery on mm. the Falls, have you ever been there? It's oh so God, pretty, yeah. right? Yeah, and I interviewed um, a couple of years ago both the founders whose names, <laughs> sorry, mm-hmm. apologies, um, but I cannot believe this. I mean, it's right there. You're in the water, essentially. You're oh sitting gosh. on the water, and the falls are there. What a setting. Yeah. So to not tell someone on the way to Unahog to go stop at Brown's is so silly, right? We yeah. should yeah. tell them what to do but this, the, and how to have that experience right. because it's not clearly obvious. Um, and so to have yeah. them be part of that discovery, and then we sort of build out a guide to every town that we can share with other people. And if you can't do it that night, you can go another time. But mm. this road trip to Husuk Falls is is good for Husik Falls. Mm -hmm. That town has struggled Mm -hmm. a lot. They (laughs) did not need a water crisis on top of the things, the challenges that they faced before. And so there are people coming there uh, who live there and they're saying, this is going to be great here. They're starting with locally sourced food and beers and products and, you know, a venue that they think is about them. And it's, and it is so nice to go out there and hear their stories and, you know, take these road trips um, that why not share the road trip? We not just the a, event. I mean, that, that is how I do my weekends, essentially. Right. Those sort yeah, of weeks. yeah. But um, Katie has, uh, well, we have a story. It's not by Katie. But uh, in the next issue <laughs> like, about uh, a coffee shop that. Sarah uh, Heikinen. Yeah, Sarah Heikinen. Heikinen. About um, a coffee shop that has cannabinoids yeah. <laughs> um, out in Music yeah, like Falls. CBD stuff. Yeah. And th- she'll be part of the story yep. right. of, of, of where you should go. And yeah. this is something that we should make, you know, once we have the platform set up, which we will, um, but to let everybody add what you should do to Hoosick yeah. Falls. Yeah. So we will start a Hoosick Falls. Like a map. Pit, yes. Kind of and everybody should add to yeah. it and tell their, their story about the what's going on. part, I think, about learning about different spots and things that people enjoy is like the very specific things that they enjoy about each thing because it's easy for a business to write about themselves and be like, these are all the things that we have. Like we already, like, you know that they're trying to sell you something in a way, but it's so much more like enjoyable to know like, oh, this place has the best mac and cheese you'll ever eat in your entire life. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like that kind of thing where you're like, okay, now I have to go try this very specific thing because this person has definitely been there and enjoyed it. Like, I think that's really valuable to describing places and like giving it more of a personality than just like a general description. And adding the name of who you say hi to, right? Mm -hmm. It's so important to be able to know who the store owner is or or just be greeted when you walk in and such a different interaction when you know who's there. Mm-hmm. So just to offer that to people, I think, is the spirit of the road yeah. trip. Just broaden out, talk about the town. Exactly. The next one we're going to do in November is about Catskill, which mm-hmm. is a place that I now live and I'm, I'm transitioning to. And you're from down that neck of the woods. Yep. Germantown so. and Athens. That's <laughs> where I grew up, right? Catskill in the middle. But. And those towns are have such deep and amazing offerings and so just to let people know what's new there and not and what's old there right you know all of those things together is what (laughs) but but it's so cool when you get to have like thomas cole house and and avalon lounge which is a new nightclub in the same town you're you're doing well then Mm -hmm. in in a gorgeous setting oh it's i mean yeah catskill has transformed so drastically um i mean it's just and in the span of maybe two years or less um because you know i used to go down there all the time and when i lived there it was the burger king and the movie theater were the only things there um, was there a burger king i didn't the know. burger king has always been a <laughs> <laughs> it was the, i think the founding fathers opened a burger king. <laughs> but um no but but i mean obviously high low there's a record shop mm-hmm. there's a bookstore it's everything that uh, and more than some of the larger towns around here have um in terms of the arts or things that people with that sort of tastes might want um and it's amazing to see the folks who live there now. And obviously you know a lot of them and we've written about a few of them, but um, it speaks to that, obviously the 
the folks fleeing the city, but also folks there finally being empowered to sort of start these businesses because there are enough people there that care now yeah. that there's a bookstore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it reminds like daring to to like do things that are like really interesting and like culturally relevant and like I don't know, just like really um, eccentric or, or different acts too that they're booking in places like yeah. Avalon and Hilo and stuff like that. Yep, and you can't do that you don't mm-hmm. can't take that kind of risk in the city anymore yeah. unfortunately you know you can't open yeah. a weird super weird whatever right you can do a safe weird yeah. whatever <laughs> but you can't do what these little towns offer you you know yeah. is to sometimes when I first went to Catsco I was walking past something I'm like is that a store I, you couldn't quite you, like, that's how tell. that's how shop. aware it was. And, <laughs> that's um, how I felt about the Rodney shop yeah. <laughs> I love the Rodney the, the, what shop what a story There's, he's such a good friend and such an amazing person you know, is. so yes but true it's and it's a different idea of a store it's like Rodney in a place that you can go <laughs> talk to it, yeah and he changed the idea of what a store is, you yeah. know, or what an artist is or mm-hmm. the environment you can create. But you can't do that everywhere. Yeah. That's that's well, a and, new and the, proposition and, and one we've got here, only here. Mm-hmm. You know? The idea, I mean, that he is an internationally known artist who has created these and worked with these brands that a lot of people know. Um, and he's essentially getting by by selling this stock that he gets in every once in a while from his friends in Japan, which is where it was made and the most popular he can only do it because, I mean, if you didn't, if you're waiting for your stock to come into New York, you'd close. I mean, there'd be no way to keep the store open. But, um, you know, when I. Uh, or told, even just trying to like sell it in yeah. a larger store that sells other things, like you'd have less of an ability to really curate something then. But uh, folks have tuned into it and now they travel out there from everywhere because they're, they're fans of his. Um, and, you know, it's. Yeah, it's, it's a cool. destination. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep, for sure. And, um, I think so many people are afforded that opportunity to decide if I had a space, what would I do with it? They mm-hmm. can literally try that on for size. It's, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, life changing. And where in Catskill again? Uh, where am I? No, where, where, where's the event? <laughs> I'll give out my address. <laughs> where, yeah, no, <laughs> come on over. <laughs> where's the event? Or uh, It will be at Avalon, Avalon Lounge, right. which is the, the um, Liam and Laura, the uh, people who yeah. started Hilo, have opened a nightclub, and it's really cool inside. Mm-hmm. Um, we will go in there. And also, um, it's going to be at Foreland, which is, uh, did you see the big building that's along the waterfront um, that is going to be a mixed-use building? It's going to have artist spaces, gallery, uh, apartments, restaurant. Um, a woman named Steph Halmos is renovating that building. It was quite an undertaking. And that's the building that... I think was owned uh, by Bob, Rob Kelly. Yeah, yeah, from Etsy. Yes, yep. exactly. Um, so there's a lot of renovation work to do, but it again is a transformative piece for Catskill, and it's right down the street. So we're going to mm. do a hard hat tour at Foreland, and then we'll walk down to Avalon Lounge and do the rest. But also tell people afterwards go to Crossroads, which is right mm. down the street, yeah. to get a beer and what else you can do there. So right. before and after. Um, so yes, that's the spirit of the road trip thing. Yeah, I mean, a town like Athens, which is right nearby where I grew up, the the abandoned opera house that uh, we used to bicycle around but also be scared of because there are too many dead pigeons nearby <laughs> is now the most amazing brewery. Um, you know, and it's just, it's amazing to see that sort of thing happen. And there's a bakery across the street and what oh, used to be a... Oh, is there? That yeah. is the best bakery <laughs> ever. It, it used to be a broken down bodega who my, like, you know, elementary school friend's dad ran. And um, now it's, you know, you can get the most amazing baked goods, yeah. Uh, my daughter and I have had a number of sit-downs there. Yeah, my daughter and <laughs> yeah, too. Yeah, it's, it's great there. Um, and the Stewart House, I don't know what's going on there now, but it's beautiful on the water yeah. and historic, and, you know, it's amazing that how much has been transformed in a few years. And then there's all those towns. Once you start discovering Coxsackie yeah. right up the road, you know, it, it has a great effect on all the rest of those pieces too as yep. to what can happen. Right. Um, the river yeah. towns especially, it's nice to be able to travel there and see mm-hmm. the river as opposed to Albany where you cannot see the river. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Well, they're working on that. They are. Yeah. <laughs> We're not, let's check back in in a year, and we'll see if we can if we well, are blocked I'd, from I'd the water. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that Dominic Calcellaro, uh, friend, has been and former councilman, has been advocating that for I don't know since he was elected oh, the ten years ago. Thing? Yeah, tear down seven eighty seven. Um, yeah. Well, been, they're on, and people are on it. Yeah. So hopefully, that would be an amazing piece for really us cool. because we are a water setting here, yeah. right? And and yet- like this, when you're driving past the city, like everybody, um, 
like I think of a lot of bands that come through here and like I have conversations with them and they're like we get to Albany and we're like whoa like this is really cool looking like the skyline but then you're just kind of like assaulted with all this concrete <laughs> and it's like yeah, yeah. We'll there's see what we it can has do, a lot of potential right? yes, yeah exactly um I'm gonna use that as a really quick segue into regionalism right mm-hmm. because that the waterfront's a shared proposition and yet we have so many municipalities and so many different interests here as to how, how to work together is just one of those it's one of those examples of what happens when we work together to have a vision for mm-hmm. what that waterfront can be because um I'm going to so get the numbers wrong but Tom Nardachi was saying the other day of how many municipalities I think there were seven or eight that weigh in on just a three mile stretch of water mm-hmm. right but you have to have this shared vision of what mm. we can be. And that's sort of what I think the creative economy does for people is to say, this eight counties, you know, it doesn't matter about county. Erase all those things. Erase the borders between your towns and take a look at what we have together because together, that's that that's what people can see from afar, mm. right? They're, we, they're, the rest of the towns are quite small to invest your, um, to know where to go and what to do. But if we can talk about ourselves as a region, we are competitive with any major city if and if not have advantages over them you know uh so this million people that we have would make us the 14th largest city in the united states of america and um we can talk about ourselves that way and it will be a lot easier to understand what's here if we had sort of a a shared um vision of what this region is because we haven't really branded it or given it any brand attributes, you know, as an old brander, um, that's the kind of thing you need to do to make something meaningful. You need to tell them what that brand means. And we don't have one here. We did um, last year after the roundtable tour, we uh, got a grant to do focus groups, uh, online focus groups with $100,000 wage earners in New York City and Boston who were willing to relocate and um, did travel, a fair bit of cultural travel. And We're surrounded by regions that they knew super well. The Hudson Valley, they knew 88%. The Berkshires, 95%. Mm -hmm. Vermont, 100%. Adirondacks, 95%. Mm. Do you know what the percentage of people knew what the capital region was? We are right in the middle. You know, you literally have to drive through us to get to those places. Do you know what the brand awareness was for us? 30%. Wow. It, it was inflated by the fact that they thought it was Washington, D.C. we were talking about. Oh, capital. So we are oh, no. we are an unbranded proposition. Yeah. And if we're doing this well as an unbranded proposition, can you imagine <laughs> if we told people what we were about? We, we could watch those people while they were doing the focus groups because it was we were lucky enough to do online focus groups, which is super cool. Um, but we started telling them from this unbranded lump of clay that we were offered that they didn't know what it was. We then told them we have 125 farm-to-table restaurants, 60 breweries, you know, 25 universities, a million people. You could literally watch it roll over them of what was here, and they were really surprised, and they said, oh, to quote, I will check that out. Um, our account manager on the project, you know, mm-hmm. our focus group account manager, was so taken by what we were telling her and what we were asking people about. She came up here the next week and wrote us and said, I love it there. My husband and I are looking for a weekend house and we're looking to move there. She had never heard of it. She was in New York right down the road. We have 40 million people within 150 miles of Albany who don't know who we are. Mm -hmm. So we're just saying, just tell them. You know, that right. will help all of our businesses, all of our freelancers, all of our creative businesses, all of the traditional businesses. Right. This will, this is what we are talking about on a region-wide level. Have a shared voice, a shared statement. It's interesting because uh, since we started the collaborative, uh, I've gotten a few messages from folks passing through Mass Mocha who pick up the magazine and say, I love what you're trying to do. And, you know, I love hearing about all these artists and giving them a voice. But I, I only go to Albany for the mall, or I only stop by. Like we're in we're in Massimoka because we come here all the time, and we know about you know the Berkshires are great, but we only you know head to this town if we want to if we want to go to Dave and Buster's or something. Right. You know, um, I didn't know there was more, and it's it is interesting to have that conversation with folks. Um, I mean, it's it's a train ride. It's a very lovely train ride from the city. Um, 
and pretty short drive from Massamoka. So um, it yep. has been with dozens revelatory. more, a, a multiplicative number of venues that yep. more than mm-hmm. the Berkshires, right? Mm-hmm. So um, this yeah, is something true. because they have 130,000 people. We have a million yeah. people with all that goes with that, right? So um, we should just tell our story. So there are a lot of organizations that um, are working together and you got everybody yep. tell this, you know, uh, let's have a shared voice about what we have here because that consistency is what builds things like Nickelodeon, you know, mm. it, meaning they're so robust. Those brands are so valuable and you can't disabuse someone once they've seen that brand, they know it in their bones, right? That's what we can do here. We just haven't even started. Mm. So that's our next larger <laughs> yeah. initiative, but it's really worth doing. And so for folks who want to, to attend this trip, mm-hmm. uh, the, the various road trips, yeah, um, it's your site? Yep, upstatecreative.com upstate yep. and, or .org, both. Um, and they're every month. They, we Always on a Wednesday. We just change which Wednesday, but we go. And you do request sign-ups, right? But, we do. But it's free. We do, because we like to tell the venue how many people mm-hmm. are coming. And they're getting weirdly large sometimes. So... Uh, just to help the venue know, are we going to have there. rollover parking problems mm. or things? So that's sometimes uh, helpful for us to know beforehand. But and folks can go to WMHT.org to watch Creative Capital. On Monday okay. at 9 p.m. Okay. Yeah. I, I have seen a couple things of saying it will be on demand or, you know. Yes, um, it will so be, but there is the, yes. the, the first premiere. Yes, you're totally correct. No, no, no. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm, a, I'm one of those people who no longer has TV of any right. sort. Um, Me so, because, yeah. I don't either. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, yeah, thank you so much for coming on, and, and we look forward to, I'm sure we'll get to a number of those events. Uh, I've actually been trying to get friends to go to Browns and Music Falls for a while now because I don't drink, but sitting in that place it's is... so pretty. Yeah, it, it's a different kind of experience. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun. Thank you. Mm-hmm.